Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Hello friends and welcome back to another episode of Health, Psychology and Human Nature with Andre Stureson, a science-focused podcast where we explore, learn and improve our lives together. Do you know somebody who doesn't really like how they look? It's both women and men who have thoughts about their appearance. Muscle dysmorphia, the Adonis complex and body dysmorphia is explained in today's episode. We get into what these concepts are, what we can do about them and also what non-clinical individuals can do. Dr. Roberto Olivardia is a clinical psychologist lecturing psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He maintains a private psychotherapy practice in Lexington and specializes in treatment of eating disorders and body image issues in boys and men. Friends, please enjoy. Roberto, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. I love love your microphone. It sounds sounds very smooth and and great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to thank my friend. I have a friend who does a podcast and he recommended this mic, so I'll I'll have to give him a uh, a big thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll send an send an email to your friend afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, um so big thank you for coming on. I think um today we're going to talk about something that I don't, I'm not sure that I'll let so many that many people have have heard about it, which makes it even more interesting, I think. Um and and we're going to talk about start talking about the Adonis Adonis complex because you and two other wrote a book about that, right? Correct. And what what, what was the book called? Sure, it was uh, the Adonis complex: the secret crisis of male body obsession. And then the paperback version, um, actually, they gave it a slightly different title: um, the Adonis complex under let me see how to identify, treat, and prevent body obsession in men and boys and my co-authors are harrison g pope jr and Catherine phillips right yeah and I, I thought perhaps we should start off then by talking about the adonis complex since that's the name of the book so like what is the adonis complex sure so the three of us uh for years prior to the publication of the book have uh, been involved in the study and research of looking at body image problems in both men and women. Um, and, and that includes people who struggle with eating disorders like anorexia, nervosa, where people starve themselves and fear that they're too fat or overweight, people who have bulimia nervosa, where people are binge eating and then they either uh, self-induce vomiting or laxative use or overexercise people with binge eating disorder where they're binging but without the purging, as well who have some body dysmorphic disorder where they might see a part of their body. It could be their nose, their skin, their genitals, their hair, and they think it's really ugly or deformed when it looks fine. Um, we, uh, so we, for and men who abuse anabolic steroids or who use anabolic steroids to gain muscle mass, um, who a lot of whom have body image uh, insecurities. So for years we've been doing these scientific studies and then it occurred to us that, um, you know, it's one thing to educate the scientific community and mental health community, but we thought this issue really needed to be out there more in the public domain for people to understand that these issues affect boys and men as well. Um, and that there's treatment available because part of my how I got into this was as an undergraduate in college, I knew two men, two of my uh, peers, uh, they didn't know each other, who had disclosed to me that they 
were struggling with an eating disorder. And this was in the mid 90s where there was no internet. It's not like we could Google, oh, yeah, men with eating disorder. Back then. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like so dark age, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it totally dates me. <laughs> a little bit. All the, yo- yeah. all, all the younger listeners are like, mm, a, a time without like, Google. Did that exist? Yeah, how, 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 how is that possible? How old are these people? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so I remember looking like in the yellow pages, you know, which is where you would look to find resources. And I'd call eating disorder facilities and they didn't accept boys. They didn't accept men. Um, A lot of them just treat women. And so we thought, let's get this in the public domain. So we wrote this book, The Adonis Complex, and it's written for the layperson. You know, we, we include certainly our scientific data, but not in scientific jargon. You know, we wanted to be very accessible. Yeah, so everybody can understand it. Exactly. Yeah. And we called it the Adonis complex because Adonis represents, he's a Greek mythological character that was half man, half God. And he was sort of the, uh, he indicated the ideal and masculine beauty in that he was very muscular, had a strong jaw. He was a protector. He was the envy of all the other men. He was the object of desire for all the women. And so when we came up with that name, it's not a scientific name, but we wanted to sort of capture the various body image issues that boys and men experience. And so we said, you know, let's use the name Adonis and the complex referring basically to um, the mass dissatisfaction, insecurities um, that a lot of men have about their bodies that surprise people. But men, unlike women, which, you know, is, is definitely a big problem, you know, with women. And unfortunately, it's so normative for women and girls to hate their bodies, which is so problematic. Yeah, for um, sure. and, and I guess the one thing, though, that's very different between men and women or boys and girls is women, because it's this you know, unfortunate normative experience, there's a sense of community and talking about it. And for the the men that I work with, they don't tell anybody, you know, yeah. I might be the only person that they're talking about this with. Um, the young boys that I treat, they, you know, they're afraid of what their peers might say, you know, about if they're obsessed with their looks, people start questioning their sexuality. And, and some men and boys who struggle with this are gay and a lot are not. Yeah, um, yeah. And so there, that's a whole, you know, separate kind of um, issue there. But just this perception that either you're gay or you're weak or you're like a girl or you're crazy, you know, that um, all of these kinds of things is steeped in a lot of shame. And so we wanted to write this book to really let people know they're not, you know, they're not alone. And, you know, that book was written, it was written 20 years ago. And I still get emails from people from around the world because it's been translated in German and Chinese and Portuguese and Greek and different languages. So I'll sometimes get emails from people from around the world that said, I just saw this book and thank you for writing it. I, I thought I was the only one. And that's and if it can motivate people to seek treatment and have their lives be better, that's that was what our goal was. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a really great goal, especially as you say, when 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 it seems like there's so like there's so many guys men men and, and boys who are who seem to be read really alone with this as well oh completely i mean they feel very much isolated now one of the things with the internet and social media is that you know one of the upsides to it i think there are a lot of downsides to it but one of the upsides is that people now can see and have access to youtube videos of Ath- like male athletes who struggle with eating disorders. Like there's an athlete named Mike Marjama, who was a base, very popular baseball player here in the States, who there's a wonderful YouTube video that I would recommend people watching where he talks about, um, you know, his issue with uh, bulimia. And there, um, you know, so when you see these sort of f- football players, you know, that talk about struggling with binge eating disorder and, you know, male celebrities, that is very powerful. It's very validating to be to hear you know just this diversity of boys and men that are struggling with these issues and more importantly that they got help for it and that they're better off um you know for it so in that way with the younger people i work with i'm seeing i definitely am seeing less of a stigma attached to 
with the older men that I see, you know, some of who've been struggling with it for 20, 30 years, there's still an incredible stigma around it. Right. And it's as, as we just discussed before we started recording also that it's, it's, it's like when it, if you had it for such a long time, then it's probably much more ingrained and much harder to deal with as well than if you're 15, for example, and get help when you're 15. Absolutely. That, you know, I always say recovery is possible at any age. I once worked many years ago with a man. He was 72 years old, yeah. 72 years old. He was struggling um, with a combination of anorexia and bulimia and really negative body image for literally since he was 12 years old. And he we he worked really hard in treatment and he recovered. And, you know, he lived, I think, until his mid 80s. And he said that those 10 or so years um, that he was free of it were totally worth it, you know, for him. Um, and however, it's the longer you have in struggle with these things, the certainly the harder it's going to be, especially with something like an eating disorder, because it's a medical issue as well as a psychological issue. So treatment, the earlier the treatment, absolutely the, the better it's going to be. Yeah, for sure. It really makes me happy when you, when you, like when you just said that, I mean, that yeah, he actually, or I, that he had at least 10 years when, when, when he was actually more satisfied. That's really great. Yeah, it was, it was very, it was, you know, before he ended up passing away of cancer and, but, um, during, you know, his final year, I mean, he said that these were like the best years of his life because he was free of this, you know, it, he, he likened it to an addiction. He goes, it's like if somebody's, you know, using heroin for their whole life and then suddenly they're sober and they get to see, they get to wake up and feel the sun on their face and they get to enjoy things in the moment as opposed to obsessing about how many calories they ate that day and did they eat too much and are they too fat should they go out that day are they too ugly i mean he was tormented by these thoughts for his entire life yeah and how great that we then can help people when we're 15 so that they, they don't become 72 and has had it their entire exactly. lives exactly yeah it's exactly great. Um, i thought that we perhaps could get into to the these different words in, in a little bit more detail, just so that we fully understand what this is all about. So, so you talked about body image. Is is like if, if you would describe the, like the Adonis complex again? Like, so what is it? Like, what what is it about? Sure. So that's good. definitely with body image because that is one of those terms that um, I'm glad you asked that question because a lot of times we there are these different conceptualizations of it. So body image is not our appearance. So our appearance is this sort of concrete data of what we look like. So yeah. I am five foot 11 and a half. I have brown eyes. I have dark brown hair. That's my appearance. So that's pretty concrete. So if, if you were to measure me, you're going to see those measurements. You'll see that my eyes are brown. Our body image is the picture that we have of ourselves in our head. Now that could be our appearance. And, but for a lot of people, especially people who have what we call distorted body image or negative body image, the image they have in their mind could be totally different than how they actually look. It's the image they have in their mind. It's how you feel about your body. Yeah. It's the attitudes you have around your body. It's the thoughts that you have around your body. And it's how you think other people see your body um, and in the functionality of it and what it can do. So for example, you know, somebody could, um, you know, be, let's say in really great shape and know they're in good shape, but they might be very dissatisfied with their body image because they're thinking, oh, I, I could be in better shape. And so I'm dissatisfied with this body because I know it could be better. Right. And so now their body image is sort of skewed in a way that has them not look at themselves so positively. Um, subsequently, you can have people, let's say, who are overweight and might say, you know, yeah, maybe I'd like to lose a little weight, but I'm happy with my body. Like I'm able to do these things and I accept, you know, my body as it is. And they could have a, a better body image than, let's say, somebody who's of, you know, like a quote unquote, like healthier weight, um, could have a worse body image. And so it's all this combination. Now our body image can be affected and impacted by many variables. So studies show that our age can play a big factor. When we're younger, we tend to be more insecure about our body image. 
certainly around puberty. I mean, I, I know I certainly would want to go through puberty again. It was tumultuous the first time around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I have two kids. I have a son who's almost 15 and a daughter who's almost 13. And, you know, seeing them grow and thinking, oh, my gosh, like I remember, you know, what that was like when your body's sort of changing. And sometimes it's changing in ways that you're like, cool, this is awesome. Yeah. And then other <laughs> yeah. it's changing, you're like, oh, like I could I could do without the acne and I could do without this and that. And um, so th- that time, it's no accident or it's not a coincidence that we see the development of eating disorders and body image problems around puberty because that that transition can be so overwhelming. Um, we find that for the most part, as people age, that their body image actually gets better, um, which surprises people because they're like, oh, don't you think with wrinkles and gray hair and those things? I think often when studies have looked at older adults, they just get to a point where they're like, who cares? Like they're more they're more <laughs> yeah. focused on what their bodies are doing, like how can they walk? Can they move? Can they, the function, you know, when you're right, in, how you look, can they yeah. function? Exactly. Like, because when you're in your sixties and you might have some friends who need canes or things like that, if you're able to walk and move freely, you appreciate your body, you know, in a very different kind of way. Um, so age can play, you know, your generation, your, where, what part of the world you grew up in. I mean, there are parts of the world where, having more weight on you is valued. There are, even in the U.S., for example, you know, more metropolitan cities tend to have more thinner ideals, you know, for women, let's say, um, and for men to look more fit, you know, than let's say the Midwest, you know, the U.S., where, you know, you might have more farmers and everything who value having a strong body to sort of do more physical work. And so there's our ethnicity. There are studies that look at different ethnic groups and different body image ideals. And so, but I always ask people as a way of kind of assessing your own body image is when you look in the mirror, what do you notice about your body? Um, Are you only noticing the things you don't like? Are you noticing the things you do like? Do you say to yourself, Hey, yeah, maybe I'm shorter than the average guy, but you know, I, I like my smile and I like my eyes and I like these other things. Um, you know, do you say very negative things like I'm a fat pig, I'm disgusting, I'm ugly. And to understand that you're basically verbally abusing yourself when you do that. Like if you were to talk to somebody else that way, which a lot of my patients that I work with are some of the kindest, most sensitive people, so compassionate towards other people, but so self-critical when it comes to themselves, you know, and and their body image. I said, like, would you ever say that to a friend of yours? Like, oh my gosh, you're 10 pounds overweight, you disgusting slob. And they're like, no, of course I would never say that. I'm like, but you're saying that to yourself and that has an impact on your mood and it has an impact on how you then interact in the world. So it's, I think it's an important thing for us. And then there are, you know, lots of people that are like their body image is around being strong and being functional and and those kinds of ways. But tapping into what is that dialogue that you say to yourself around your body? Right. So, so the the kind of the root here is really how you feel about yourself and what you think about yourself. Would you say that that is, so that is the root, root of this? Absolutely. Because then when you have people that are, seeing their bodies in very negative ways and and then having thoughts of, oh, because I look this way, nobody's going to love me. And then they have actions such as, I'm not going to leave the house today because my hair looks messy. Then you start to see that your body image starts is starting to significantly impact your life. And there are lots of people that might be like, yeah, my hair is messy, so what? I'm still going to work today. And so they might still have a perception, let's say, of their hair being messy, but the impact of it is very minimal. And that's part of our body image is not just what we think, but the impact that those thoughts then have on our day and have on our functioning. Right. And then when you start to really think about this and you think about this a lot and you're you're almost obsessing or, or you are obsessing over it, is it then that it becomes a diagnose or how does it work? Yeah. So where we say it becomes a problem, because, you know, it's it's very normal for for any individual. There are going to be parts of your body that you love, that you like, that you most of which you might feel neutral about. 
some of you're going to dislike, and there are probably parts of your body that you really dislike. And that's actually normal body image, actually. I, I, I mean, I... I personally have never met anyone that's 100% satisfied with 100% of their body. Um, but it might not, it doesn't, it might not matter the things that they're dissatisfied with. So where it becomes a problem is when you start to see the negatives outweigh the positives and that the, the weight, uh, for, I guess for lack of no pun intended, the weight of those negatives is really impacting the way you feel about yourself as a person. So it's more than, oh, you know, I don't, I, I don't like my mus, my muscularity. I want to work out at the gym, versus and and improve that. Versus, I don't like my muscularity. I'm unlovable. Um, right. I'm, you know, deformed in in that way. How it affects your overall self esteem. A, a lot of the patients I work with who struggle with this, they have wonderful traits. They're smart. They're personable, they're loving, but they overvalue their appearance to the degree that they think those other things don't matter. They'll say, well, none of those, yeah, maybe I'm a straight A student, you know, I'm an excellent student in school, but I look ugly. And so it cancels that out for them. And, and when it shouldn't, you know, we, there are lots of things about our self-esteem, you know, self-esteem is basically the overall worth and value we ascribe to ourselves that we don't have to love our bodies to have a healthy self-esteem. We just have to see our bodies as something that has inherent worth to it and we can improve upon it. Again, there's nothing wrong with healthy eating and healthy exercise. Um, and But it doesn't mean that you, that, that has to cancel out all these other positive aspects of yourself. So if we start to see that happen, if we start to see somebody who is avoiding situations in, in their lives because of their body image. I'm not going to go out today. I'm going to cover up, you know, this part of my body that I don't like. Um, and especially if they start engaging in any kind of dangerous, unhealthy behaviors. So binging, purging, starving, diet pills, laxative use, anabolic steroids, over-exercising. And what I mean by that is, you know, I work with men who are at the gym five six hours a day yeah. um, lifting weights, um, which is not healthy and not even effective. I mean, honestly, they, you're not getting any more muscular after maybe the first hour and a half, two hours that you're working out. I mean, it's really not the, the, the effect of that is not as great as people you know, think it is. Um, it's really getting in the way of their social life and their relationships that – their partners are like, you know, all you're talking about is the way you look. And I feel like there's nothing else in this relationship or you're at the gym and I don't get to see you. Um, you're missing these important events because you're afraid of eating the food in the restaurant and you're only, you know, you're obsessed with the kind of food you eat. And so all of those things, and then certainly when there's a body image distortion. So when you, I, I have patients who they think that they're balding and they have a full head of hair. They think that they're not muscular when any person would assess them as being muscular. Um, they might think, you know, that they're fat when they're, you know, in, in fine shape. Um, so that's when you know this is this is going to get become a big problem, right? And that that is muscle dysmor dysmorphia, right? When you when you perhaps are quite well trained, you got muscle, but you you don't see yourself as being particularly muscular. Correct. So muscle dysmorphia is a term that we coined in our research where we were starting to see men in studies that we would recruit for body image and eating disorder studies. And I would, I remember getting calls from men who said, well, I used to have anorexia where I was starving myself when I was a teen. And then I realized I don't want to be skinny, but I want to be lean mm. and muscular. So I don't care that I'm overweight but I care if I'm over fat. And that is a variable that is distinctly different between men and women because with women, being overweight and over fat are the same thing to them. Like, um, whereas for men, like most bodybuilders are actually overweight. Like they, they tip the scales in terms of like the, you know, the medical guidelines. Um, but they don't care if they're five, nine, 260 pounds, as long as that 260 pounds is almost all muscle. And so that's very different. Whereas women, you know, don't really value muscularity as, as an ideal body image. So if a woman is five, nine, 260, 
you know, she's overweight, over fat. Like it's the, sort of the same thing for her. Um, but for a lot of these men, so I thought this is interesting. And they said, but now I feel like I swung the pendulum in the other direction where I'm just as obsessed with calories. I'm just as obsessed with working out, except I don't want to be skinny. I'm looking to get bigger and I'm never satisfied. But they, and they would tell me, I remember the very first call I got around this and this man, he was so insightful. He said, I feel like it's the same thing as anorexia. The only difference is I'm eating food and I'm striving to be muscular, but I'm just as obsessed. And so I remember bringing him in and interviewing him and assessing him. And then we started finding other guys with this who, and interestingly, a lot of them had a previous history of anorexia. So, um, but they said that their goal was never to be skinny. Their goal was to just lose body fat, but they didn't anticipate that in losing body fat, they were also going to lose muscle and they realized, oh no, this isn't what I want. And I see a lot of boys today in my practice who have anorexia, who their anorexia is different than how you might see it in girls. A number of them really know, they know that they're emaciated, but for them, you know, we can't build muscle unless we have fat and they're afraid of that. They're like, well, if you can guarantee me everything that I eat is going to just convert into muscle, then I'll eat. Now, of course, we don't know. I mean, initially it's not going to turn into muscle. You know, our bodies are designed, we need body fat, you know, to survive, um, yeah. to keep ourselves warm, to regulate our hormones, to, you know, regulate testosterone. I mean, there's lots of things and that's what they're afraid of. So yeah, so we we first called it reverse anorexia, but we thought, mm, but it's not necessarily an eating disorder. And then we changed it to muscle dysmorphia. Right. And the, and again, so so the root here is is that you don't like how you how you look or you don't like your your body image, and then you try to fix that by I mean either by by really losing weight or in other circumstances by really gaining weight. So you have more, so you might have an ideal of being quite big and then you do whatever it takes to to look more like your ideal and that becomes kind of the the problem As, and, and then you also at the same time don't like yourself do like when you're striving for that ideal absolutely that these are not the men who you know you might see um you know, who might be proudly sort of showing off their bodies, they, you know, are again, pretty muscular guys, but they'll wear long sleeve shirts in 90 degree weather. They'll, um, you know, sometimes go to the gym in the nighttime. So they're not seeing, they, they literally think they look weak or scrawny. Um, so it's not that they're just self improvement. It's not like this typical self improvement. It's more of, I am offensive right now yeah. and I need to make myself look better. Now with body image though, and what this really boils down to is so many deeper issues around self-esteem and around, you know, people wanting connection, wanting control, wanting to be loved that, you know, I, I always ask patients that I work with, what is the end goal here? You know, so you are doing all of this, you're whether you're losing weight, gaining weight, gaining muscle, what is the car, the currency here with this? And most of the time what I'll hear is, oh, I'll be liked more, I'll be loved more, I'll feel more confident, I'll be more assertive, no one will mess with me. Um, so there's always that piece, and that's the piece that we have to also treat. In addition to the, the body image or eating disorder is – a number of these men that I work with struggle with assertiveness. They struggle with depression. They struggle with anxiety. Um, they struggle. Some of these men were bullied when they were kids. Some of them were traumatized, either physically abused, sexually abused, um, emotionally abused. So there's there's trauma there a lot of the time in, in some ways. And our bodies become a very accessible way for us to try to regain control in our lives. Um, in a lot of ways, it's like, well, I can't control all these other things around me, but I can control what I eat. I can control how much weight I lift at the gym. And so it's often those deeper issues that are at play. All right. So, so just so I, so, so I understand. So, so it's a lot about self-esteem and a lot about connection and a lot about being, I mean, being appreciated perhaps for who you are. And so it's the, would you say that these kinds of things are the things that are also like the end thing here, like the root? 
Absolutely. Because at the end, you know, what we're trying, what I'm always trying to do with a- any patient that I'm working with, but especially, you know, with these patients is you are worthy, you have value inherently. And so whether you're getting, you know, the best grades in school or the worst grades, it doesn't make you a bad person or an inferior person. Now, we obviously want you to be, you know, happy and successful, and that's understandable. Um, But at the same time, we can't have your self-esteem contingent upon the way you look, because especially with appearance, like it's one thing if our self-esteem is based upon you know, self-esteem could be based on a number of variables, your intelligence, how you feel about your sense of humor, your problem solving skills, your athletic ability, your creative ability, all of these things. Now, a lot of those things that I just mentioned are very constant things in our lives. Like our intelligence is pretty much a constant. It's only, if anything, it's something we can just enrich ourselves and enhance throughout our lives, but we don't like go dumb, you know, yeah, in our lives. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. um, you know, if you have a good sense of humor, that's pretty constant, you know, throughout your life. But if let's say you're not somebody that has, who's quick on your feet, that there are, you can learn some of, there are skills and strategies to sort of learn some of those um, things. Um, but with appearance, I, I can guarantee that you will look different in 10 years than you do today. Yeah. Um, I can guarantee that your body is going to do different things. You know, I'm almost 50 and, you know, I, I mean, part of me doesn't feel 50, even just saying that. I'm like, did I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was that I me? Still, yeah. I'm like, was that me? Um, yeah. I mean, and I'm, I'm a very <laughs> youthful person. Like, I mean, I, I, you know, I love music and I love food and I love, you know, art and I'm, I, I don't consider myself old and I don't consider 50 old by any means. But, you know, when you're 30 or 20, 50 sounds like, oh, my gosh, you know, so old. Um, I'm 32. But, I, don't, I don't think it sounds that old. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, but, so, you know, on, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, I'm recognizing that my body like the one example definitely is like sleep. So I'm always a night owl. I am definitely a night person. I've been my entire life. And I was that college student that would, you know, wait for the last minute to get papers written, but I would stay up all night and I would write it and I'd get it done and I'd pull all nighters. And I'm, that wasn't good for your body. I do not recommend that people do it, but I did it many times. I had many, many nights where I was up all night, either doing that or having fun and things like that. Now, I can't do that now. Um, I don't need to do that now. But if I were to be up all night, like sometimes when I take a red eye flight overnight, oh my gosh, my body really feels it the next day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I remember when I was younger being unfazed by it. Yeah. Like just, it wouldn't even, yeah. it wouldn't you could do even, whatever. I could do whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have two nights in a row of that and it wouldn't. And so that's when I recognize, and I don't say to myself, oh, I'm getting old. I just say, you know, you have to respect where your body is. Now, at the same time, I work, I go to the gym, I run, I run in 5K races, 10K races. I, I, my goal, I'd like to do a marathon. I've done a half marathon. Um, and I like to challenge myself and I want to be healthy. And, you know, my, I have a, my grandmother lived to be 99. My dad lived to be 90. Um, so I have, on, you know, longevity in my genes yeah. and I don't smoke, I don't drink alcohol. I, you know, I, I try to be healthy. Um, but when I think back to, you know, how I was thinking about my own, my body and body image when I was in my teen years and, you know, twenties, I didn't think of it the same way. You know, I, I, I definitely, you know, I, I wouldn't say like I abused my body, but I didn't think as sort of health oriented because I don't know, for me, when I was 20, the idea of, you know, taking care of a body that's going to be around for many years just seems so far away yeah. that at that point you are thinking about like, oh, how's my hair look and how's this look? And, and you know, and I, it's not that I'm inattentive to those things. I still like to dress nice and, you know, use moisturizer on my face and brush my teeth with whitening toothpaste and, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not anything that's, um, at the end of the day, that doesn't, that those things don't matter to me. I want to be healthy. I want to be here for my kids. I want to do the work that I do, which I love and I feel passion for. And that's what I want for people is to, for them to just feel a sense of just 
passion and fulfillment in their lives and not to connect it to, oh my gosh, my knee hurts today. That means my body's failing and I'm now a worthless person, yeah. and, you know, or, or I gained a little weight. And so my self-esteem, all these important things in my life are gone out the window. For sure. I think that that if we could also get in a little bit to um, so what you can do about this because I find that very interesting and and certainly helpful I think for a lot of people. So let's say that you that you don't like the way you look or that you have that that you identify with the things that we have been talking about here today. Like yeah. wh- what are the methods, the interventions and has there been like a lot of science on this or could you tell tell us a little bit about that? Sure. That uh, the the good news is is that there are very effective treatment models in dealing with negative body image, um, eating disorders, and in this whole realm. So, in there are different kinds of therapy. So, one is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, and that refers to having people sort of assess their cognitions or their thoughts and assess them for accuracy. So, for example. If somebody says, um, you know, everyone, when I walk into a room, everyone's going to notice how ugly I am. And so we look at the thought and we don't just, it's not about changing a positive thought into, uh, I'm sorry, not about changing a negative thought into a positive thought. It's about making it accurate. So is that accurate? So we actually examine the evidence like a, when you walk in a room, how do you know that people are even thinking that, um, how do you know that they're even evaluating your appearance. What we do know from research is that people are more conscious of their own bodies than other people are about their bodies. Um, in that, you know, and sometimes it's like, why do you think people would care that much? Honestly, I mean, people have their own stuff, you know, going on. And so you assess these thoughts and you try to make them accurate, you know, to that person. And, and people with these issues exhibit what are called cognitive distortions, which are ways that all of us can think, maladaptive ways that we can think that lead us sort of into this negative space um, that are not accurate. So for example, one cognitive distortion is black or white thinking. Like if I eat, um, you know, a little piece of dessert, then I've blown my diet and I've, you know, I'm back to square one. No, that's an all or nothing way of thinking. If I miss a day at the gym, then I, it's as if I didn't work out that entire week. Nope, that's not true. Um, that, you know, if I, uh, another cognitive distortion is mind reading, which is that example I gave where you assume that other people are thinking, the negative thoughts that you have about yourself, you're assuming that other people are having towards you. And what happens is what we call a self-fulfilling prophecy. So imagine that if you have really negative body image and you believe that when you walk into a room that people are looking at you and thinking, oh my gosh, he looks so ugly. He's so disgusting. If you truly believe that, you're likely going to walk in that room with little confidence. You're likely to walk in that room maybe with your head down and your, your posture you know, not so great. And then if you walk in a room that way and you're not going to interact with people because you already assume they think you're ugly, people then are not going to interact with you, but not because you're ugly or they think you're ugly, but because you look like somebody that doesn't want to be interacted with, which then leads that person to then think, oh, see, it's true. People think I'm ugly. That's why they're not talking to me. And so part of the work is helping that person understand that their, their thoughts will then impact their behavior. So that's where the cognitive behavioral therapy and that behavior reinforces those thoughts, that those behaviors start to be problematic. So if somebody is avoiding going to a party, you know, I, I met with a patient yesterday, he's in his mid twenties and he has a lot of negative body image and he said, oh, there's this like work function and everyone's going and I really should be going. It's kind of supposed to be fun, but I gained some weight this week. Now, when he said he gained some weight, he gained 0.8 pounds. And that is, to him, a significant weight gain. So we're not talking he gained 20 pounds. And even if you gain 20 pounds, you still go to the party. However, when he says that, I have to say, okay, let's keep in mind you gained 0.8 pounds, which you can literally, that could be like water, that could be urine. I mean, you can literally urinate or later today and lose that 0.8 pounds. I mean, like this is, it's negligible, you know, weight. Um, 
So we try to work on that. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy. The other therapy is just what we call the psychotherapy, which is the more traditional talk therapy. And that's where we look at deeper issues around self-esteem, around, you know, what is your value as a person? Um, what are your relationships like? Um, you know, a lot of the people I work with um, have, you know, now sometimes because of their body image and eating disorder, but sometimes it's that they had these social issues beforehand and they kind of gravitated to focusing on their body thinking, well, if I look great, then it'll make up for all these things that these social deficits that I have and people are going to like me. And so what I'll do with them is like, no, let's, let's work on social skills. Let's work on assertiveness. Let's work on how do we develop your personality? Um, you know, especially the young people I work with where, you know, they, they feel like they have to sort of, I think this generation, millennial generation, there's so much pressure first with like social media, which we can talk about as well. Um, but just the, the pressure of being like a star, like the pressure of being on and being quick and being this, like almost like a YouTube personality, but even in like social groups, I mean, there's, I, I hear from young people today, like this just need of being quick. And so with some of them, it's, you know, what do you feel you can contribute and offer? Not everybody, first of all, no one has at all, you know, <laughs> like we all have our strengths and weaknesses and helping them identify that. But coming back down to understanding their worth and value. And then in the case of severe anxiety, severe depression, um, body dysmorphic disorder, which is coupled with a lot of compulsive behaviors like mirror checking, which people could do for hours, and um, that medication could be very helpful in curbing those symptoms. It doesn't cure the problem, but what it does is an, it, it enables somebody to even get to a point where they could benefit from the therapy because there are some people who their heads, they're just constantly tormented by obsessions that they almost can't even do the cognitive behavioral work or the talk therapy because they're so in their heads with it. And that's where medication can be very helpful in just stopping or pausing, you know, those thoughts where the person has more control in, in being able to challenge them. Right. So it's so it's really these three different ways of of handling it and it, it seems like it depends a little bit of of the person then. So if it's more self-esteem oriented then it's more psychotherapy. Is that correct or Right. Exactly. Right. And and when 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 is it when is it better to 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 use cognitive behavioral therapy in what which cases? I would say any um cases. I mean, I think it's my approach generally is more of an integrative one that I sort of combine them all together because I find that, um, you know, all, everybody that I've worked with who struggles with these are going to have these sort of negative thoughts and negative cog cognitions in that way. So I will integrate that and at the same time, you know, address some of those underlying issues. It's almost like, you know, in some ways we see this like in the world of addiction, like of drug addiction, where obviously you have to deal with the addiction because the person is using drugs or alcohol. Yeah. And at the same time, you're recognizing that most people who um, develop an addiction are self-medicating an underlying trauma, anxiety, depression. And so, you know, you want to sort of get underneath that as well in the same way, because we know they're not going to be able to maintain successful sobriety unless we've dealt with the root. But we also have to make sure they're not doing drugs. And it's so it's this balance that you're doing. And with eating disorders, I find it very similarly that, you know, you definitely need, um, you know, the person to be eating well. So that's also the other thing for eating disorders is nutritional rehabilitation, making sure that, you know, a person is being is refed if they're anorexic or, you know, curbing the binge eating episodes, have uh, eliminate purging, which is, you know, that's part of the cognitive behavioral therapy as well as how do we get mindful of, those urges, let's say, to vomit. and But instead of vomiting, what are other things you can do to kind of get out whatever tension you have, you know, after you eat, but that's healthy for you? Could we perhaps get into like an example of, um, of how like a, a CBT or how CBT could work for a person with muscle dysmorphia, for example? Sure. So with muscle dysmorphia, now what's interesting about muscle dysmorphia and, and 
some, and I would say more anorexia in particular, is there's also an ambivalence of change too, because a lot of times, um, you know, people who present with those issues, they, they don't want to change their behavior. I mean, they know that they're not happy. And at the same time, if they know that part of the treatment is for anorexia, you have to gain weight, like you need to gain weight or for the person with muscle dysmorphia, you need to get off steroids or you, we can't have you at the gym five hours a day, which means they will lose some muscle mass. Yeah. There's a, an incredible ambivalence to that. And in fact, like with men with muscle dysmorphia, I've never had a patient in all these years who comes in and says, you know, I have muscle dysmorphia and basically I don't want to have it anymore on its own. What I typically will see are either men who are pushed in here um, by their spouses or partners, um, in the case of teenagers, by their parents, or men who realize the importance or the impact of the muscle dysmorphia when they had an injury. So um, I remember years ago working with the man who um, he had basically broken like both of his arms. He was doing a tricep press and put way too much weight on it. And basically his, where your elbow joints meet, yeah. the bone just completely severed right. on both arms, um, which, you know, is ugh, like a gruesome injury. And he couldn't, I mean, he couldn't lift weights like for, I mean, they, in his case, they said it might be forever, you know, and ter- certainly what he was doing before and he went into a suicidal depression. Like he said, what is the point of living if I can't lift weights? And so that's when he saw therapy is he said, you know, I, there's something I guess wrong with that. He goes, but at the same time, if my arms were back to normal, I'd be doing it again. Um, and so, you know, we had to sort of work with that and say, well, and then by the end of the treatment, he did realize how unhealthy that was. And that, and I always tell people with this too, who struggle with these issues, the goal is not to make you unhealthy, un, inattentive to your body. Um, like, and people sometimes fear that they'll say, Oh, I'm afraid that treatment is going to make me not care at all about my body. Yeah. And I said, I have never seen that happen. I've never seen someone and, and, and frankly, I wouldn't want that to happen. That's not successful treatment. If you, you know, if you're then after treatment saying, you know what, I don't care at all. I'm yeah. going to do lots of heroin and smoke tons of cigarettes. <laughs> well, I'm successfully treated. No, I just heroin instead. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to eat Big Macs every day. Like It's like, no, my goal is to help, is to get people to a place where they're connected to their body image and healthy. I mean, I just want them healthy and and so with some of these guys, I'm like, look, I'm not anti-gym. Like, I just don't think it's healthy to be at the gym five hours a day. Like, um, and not to mention, you're not socializing in that time. Like, you're not out in the world. If you go to the gym every day for an hour, an hour and a half, that's fine. Like, that doesn't have to be pathological, um, you know, in that way. But if there's a snowstorm and the gym is closed a day, if you get suicidal, that's a problem. You know, and so sometimes it's not just around the frequency or the amount of time. It's about how they're thinking about that time. Um, so if a man with muscle dysmorphia comes in and he's saying, you know what, I'm really depressed because I can't work out as much or um, my wife says she's going to divorce me, which I've heard before, um, if I don't, you know, if I can't get away from the gym and whatnot. Um, so at first they're a little hesitant about it. And I said, you know, okay, well, let's look at what do you feel is problematic, you know, and, and let's look at how you're thinking about it. And sure enough, you'll, they'll list out these thoughts of, you know, if I'm more powerful when I'm bigger, I'm more confident, people can't mess with me, you know, all of these things. And I try to kind of sift out the theme in it. And let's say for that example, I said, well, it's clear that, you know, looking strong is really important to you because, and by the way, like most bodybuilders are not actually stronger, you know, they look strong, you know, but a lot of, but it's, you know, very different than, um, like power lifters are yeah. the guys that actually have greater body fat. Those guys are like physically stronger, but a lot of bodybuilders aren't particularly strong, but that doesn't matter to them. It's looking the part. It's looking strong. And so I, I'll say to them, you know, what do you think that's about? Like why, 
you know, I, and I I understand why it's important to want to look that way, but this seems to even be much <laughs> more important to you. And that's where you start to hear their stories around, well, I was a kid, you know, and I was awkward and I was bullied a lot. And, you know, and now you're starting to kind of deal with deeper feelings around it and to say, you know, how else can we make you feel um, a, a healthy sense of power and assertiveness that doesn't have to rely on you going to the gym all the time. Like that can't be the one outlet. Um, what are other ways that we could sort of, you know, get that sense? Um, and then if they have co these cognitive distortions, like, oh, if I eat, you know, this thing with higher sodium, then I feel like I've blown my diet. I'm like, well, is that like, are you really back at square one? Like, does your body really, you know, negate all of this work that you've done? And like, well, I'm like, guess not. You know, well, what percentage of you thinks that? And and you're kind of almost like providing this sort of rational way of looking at it. And, you know, and in a way, too, that's not shaming to them. You know, I always – it's very important, especially with men who already feel a little sense of shame or a lot of sense of shame when they come to therapy for anything, period. But therapy for body image is, you know, for clinicians, when I train clinicians or teach them about this to say, you want to be very aware that just them sitting there talking to you about this, they're already feeling emasculated, most of these guys. Um, and so you don't want to um, almost like laugh in their face when yeah. they say something that just seems so yeah. absurd to you. You want to meet them where they're at and to say, you know what? Even though I might feel differently about that, I can imagine if that scares you, like what would make you feel suicidal, that that's a scary feeling to feel like your whole sense of being in the world has been vanished because of an injury. That's scary. That's how I speak to them so that they, you know, versus, you know, and I understand this, that. A, uh, a general person might react. Are you kidding me? That's why they want to kill themselves because they broke their arm. Like there's so many, there are people dying in parts of the world and there's war and there's all of these things. And, and this is what these people hear. I mean, a lot of times is, oh, that they're vain, that they're superficial, that, um, you know, these are like first world problems and that's not helpful. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing if somebody, you know, when our friend or we might get caught in our heads about something that's really trivial, it does help sometimes to have perspective and to say, you know what, this is like, you know, the other day when my internet connection went down, I was like, oh my God, and I was all like flustered and blah. Mm, and then yeah. I'm thinking, Roberto, this is not a big deal. Like there, there's bigger and more important issues. Like people are surviving <laughs> out there. Like just because my internet goes down for an hour is not the end of the world. Like, calm yourself yeah, and, yeah. and <laughs> once and upon a time yourself. i didn't have my internet at all it, it, exactly yeah. and so that can be helpful however if it's a real clinical problem and a real issue and this is somebody you know where it was it's not going to help him to say oh really like just because you lost five pounds of muscle like you're that's so stupid you know there are people starving in the that that, that just makes them feel worse now about themselves because now they're like, you know what? That person's right. I am kind of stupid. And it doesn't change the, the way that they feel. So now they feel shame for even having, you know, these issues and it just compounds upon itself. Um, and then what I do is give them homework sort of assignments of like, okay, over the week, I want you to pay attention when you're in the mirror getting yourself ready. I want you to talk out loud whatever thoughts come into your head as opposed to, you know, all of us, our body image talk is often just internal. And some of these guys will come back the next week and they're like, whoa, they're like, I didn't realize like I uh, like abuse myself verbally when I talked out loud, the stuff that came out of my mouth, I don't think I've ever said to anybody and would never say to anybody. So it helps them be mindful. And I'm like, well, that's language that you're internalizing in your head 24 seven. So is it any wonder that, you know, you're you're freaking out about, you know, losing some muscle mass or gaining weight or your hair thinning or any, you know, whatever the body image issue is. And it helps them recognize it. And then a big part of the work is what else, what gives you fulfillment in life? I mean, so let's assume, you know, one question I often ask, um, something called the miracle question in cognitive behavioral therapy is, let's say tomorrow you woke up 
and a miracle happened where you woke up and all your body preoccupations, every you had the ideal body that you wanted, the ideal appearance. Every like, and you literally didn't have to work on it again. You didn't have to go to the gym. You don't have to eat certain foods. You're all set. What then do you do in that day? What do you? What are you going to do in your life? And then basically, what the the goal of the therapy is to do whatever those things are now. So if somebody, and a lot of times when I ask people that question, they'll say, "Oh, I'm." I'm going to, you know, hold my head up high and I'm going to have a strong posture and I'm just going to like do more things. I'm going to finally, you know, um, join that club that I want to join or I'm going to finally pick up the guitar and learn how to play guitar, which I've always wanted to do. I'm going to have the confidence to ask that girl on a date that I've been, you know, secretly crushing on. And, and I'm like, okay, so now we have goals. We can work on those right now. Like you don't need to have a miracle occur, to have those things happen. There are millions of people who are in relationships, happy relationships, that don't have 6% body fat. Um, you know, there are many people who are have all different kinds of bodies who can still help hold their heads up high. Um, and that's, that's what we try to do, is have them realize that the end goal is really not about the body. The end goal is about what you feel you'll do when you have that body, what, what are the things that you feel held back from because you're in the body that you're in? I was also thinking about, uh, if let's say if you don't have the clinical levels of yeah, being critical towards yourself, what like to, to the, to the non clinical person, do you have any tips for, for how to like yourself more and how to be more appreciative of your body? Absolutely. That I think, you know, to really um, force yourself, you know, to be to say a kind, compassionate statement about your body. And, and, and when I say about your body, it doesn't have to be about the aesthetics of your body. It could be, wow, like I'm really strong. I was able to, you know, lift that thing or, um, oh, someone commented on this nice smile that I have, which means that my smile makes somebody feel warm and friendly. Um, you know, and in some, and it could be like, oh, wow, I look really good in these colors that I'm wearing, um, today. Um, you know, we were so much more likely to criticize ourselves. And this is for the everyday person that I, I want to give your listeners a challenge to every day, you know, comment on something positive about, um, their, their body, um, in, in that way and be aware. And then if there is something let's say that they notice that they're, that they're thinking negatively about is to think, to be aware of how they're talking to themselves. So it's one thing if someone's saying like, Oh, like I'm so weak, I'd like to build up my strength. Um, and so, you know, maybe I'll add in, you know, something at the gym and do some weight training. That's fine. But if someone's like, Oh, I'm so weak, I'm pathetic. Um, you know, then it's like, oh, wait a minute. Now we're going into like your character and, you know, we, it doesn't have to get to that level. And that's not motivating. A lot of times, even the everyday person who doesn't struggle with the clinical issue sometimes is of this belief that, well, if I bash myself, I'm going to motivate myself to eat better and go to the gym. That if that works, that's only going to work for a couple of weeks and then it stops working. I mean, let's look at what happens on January 1st, New Year's resolution, the number one New Year's resolution <laughs> yeah, yeah. is lo losing weight. Yeah. And so the gym, like it's packed, you know, in the first month two of weeks of January. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's right. I said a month. You're right. It's probably more the first two weeks and people drop off. And but again, it's that all or nothing part is that, you know, why? is opposed a lot of people go in gung ho like i'm going to work out four or five days a week let's just start with very short measurable goals and that's another thing i recommend to people is if you do want to lose weight if you want to build muscle if you just want to build your cardiovascular endurance you know is don't you know go into it in a way that is just not going to be sustainable. Um, you know, if you're trying to change your eating habits, don't change five things about your eating habits at once. Start with one. You know, if, if one of them is like, oh, I'm a late night snacker. I, um, you know, eat uh, too many like fast foods every week. 
Um, I eat a lot of sugar. I don't eat enough vegetables. Instead of doing all four of those goals on one week, one week, just start by eliminating the late night snacking and see how that works, you know, one at a time so that it feels like, okay, I can do this in in my life in in that way. Um, Also, for parents out there who are listening, is be very aware of how you're talking about your body, your body image, um, food um, in front of your children. And this is is for true for your sons as well as your daughters, because I have, I think it's it's definitely more accepted that um, moms, you know, be aware of how they talk about in front of their daughters, because you know we don't want their daughters adopting negative body image issues and whatnot. Um, but dads, be aware of how you're talking in front of your daughters. Moms, be aware of how you're talking in front of your sons. Dad, be aware of how you're talking in front of your sons. Like Because even studies have shown that even across gender, that kids are still getting a lesson as to how to relate to your body from your parents. Now, they're also going to get it from peers, from now social media and things like that, but parents are a very powerful influence. And a number of the patients I work with, um, there is a genetic predisposition to things like eating disorders and OCD and body dysmorphic disorder. But a number of the patients I work with um, will have a parent that has had an eating disorder or body image problem or currently does. And I've heard from a number of parents over the years, both fathers and mothers, who said, wow, you know, I didn't, because I work with boys, that they said, you know, I, I always knew to shut my mouth and to not talk about how fat I looked or how I need to run off that meal after dinner in front of my daughters, but it never occurred to me that my son, <clears throat> that my son could take this and kind of have this be this sort of negative force in his life. So, you know, for parents, for your own sake, that's important to, you know, have a good body image, but also just be aware of how that is around your kids. You know, do you put on clothes and say, "Ugh, I can't wear this. I look so fat in this. Oh, I'm not going to buy that outfit until I lose 20 pounds. You know, like these are all messaging that we're giving our young people. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Roberto, is, is there something else that you, you would like to mention now before, before we end the conversation? I, I think we covered it well. I guess the one other thing I would say is the powerful effect of social media. I just did a, a talk a couple of days ago to a group of parents, and I really delved into the scientific literature of social media. And it's um it's pretty depressing in terms of the impact that um every you know Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all of these things can have on young people's body image. That studies show that with greater exposure with greater comparisons um, that people feel worse about their bodies after, you know, sort of having exposure to this. Now, I'm not saying that we should ban, you know, these things or that people, that there aren't upsides to using some of these, um, these social media platforms. However, I would urge parents, um, well, first, I'm, you know, right now, neither of my kids have any social media. And my goal is to get them through high school without it. We'll, we'll see. You'll have to check in, that's, check that's in with me in a tough goal, year. Roberto. That's <laughs> a tough goal. It's good, good, I think good work. Be harder than running a marathon. Yeah. But we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> However, if and when they do, um, it's so important for parents to have conversations with their kids around because studies show that it's not like everybody, you know, who's going to, oh, I see a body on Instagram. Now I feel bad about myself. It's the thought process of, oh, how am I comparing myself to that person? Or, oh, that body is so realistic. I should look that way. You know, having parents check in with their kids of how they're consuming that media, you know, so when they see, you know, um, like when a young boy sees the rock, you know, um, that is, he saying, wow, the rock is a really strong built guy. He has a nice body. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If that kid is saying, oh my gosh, like he has it all because of that body. And, oh, now look at me. I look disgusting, you know, compared to him. And I need to look that way in order to be, then you're going to have a problem. So noticing the body, complimenting it, that's not the problem. That's totally fine. It's how, that internal dialogue that happens. And, and again, I guess just in, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that we're having this conversation just to continue to get the message out there is to not 
to not assume that these aren't affecting your sons um, and the boys and the men in your life. Not just I'm not talking about just young people. I mean, I work with men in, of all ages, um, you know, to check in. Like, how how do you feel about this? And and sometimes, you know, the boys and guys might respond like, oh, what are you talking about? Like, oh, I'm not you know, I don't care about the way I look and everything. And um, because we have these sort of masculine codes. But then if you continue to ask, sometimes it's you start to when you sort of say it as, well, it's actually quite normal for men to have those you know, thoughts too. Oh, really? And then a lot of times they start to open up um, about it. Um, so that, yeah, that would be the only thing I would add is just be good sort of consumers of social media. It can do a lot of good. And then there are parts of it that are not so great. Roberto, a big, big thank you for, for that last and a big, big thank you for the entire conversation. It's been, it's been really, really interesting. And I think that we have all learned a lot. So a big, big thank you for coming on. Oh, absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thank okay. you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Take care. <clears throat> a rating and a review is a great thing. But if you will start to subscribe, you will make my heart sing. Have a great one, friends. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Yeah.